Okay, I'm recording. Hey, this is Stefan Kinsella doing an episode of Kinsella on Liberty podcast. This should be number 208. I've got my old friend Neil Shulman online, and we've actually met in person, haven't we, Neil? Yeah, as I recall, it was at uh, Libertopia a few years ago. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How about you? It's all right. Let's see. Today's March 4th, 2016. You and I have known each other for... uh, Maybe, what, 30-plus years now? It's been a while, and remember? I must say that we're a lot friendlier now than we used to be. Well, in the beginning, it was friendly. Remember on the Genie forums in the old days before the Internet? My God, I didn't remember that uh, we, we, uh, we met on Genie. That goes back to uh, the early 90s. Yeah, that's where I sent you the, uh, the review of, uh, of your, uh, of your uh, Heinleinania book. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, and it's one of the um, uh, many interests we have in common. Yeah, Heinlein. Of course, you knew him better than I did. Well, I was, uh, I, I was very lucky to be able to uh, interview him for the New York Daily News, uh, which led to our meeting and subsequent friendship. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> well, I, th- I think we're friendly when we're not uh, threatening to uh, convert each other to IP socialism depends on our definitions. <laughs> uh, there, uh, uh, actually, it's amazing how much we agree on, uh, and there's just you know this one bone of contention which has occupied ninety percent of our energy. Yeah, and and probably it's only because as I've d- dug into this IP issue over the years, I get more and more to meticulous details because I keep seeing. What I think are the errors that cause the, some uh, some mistakes to keep being perpetrated. So I get more and more to minutia. And um, but anyway, uh, you remember a few years ago, um, I think I uh, I dug up the old uh, uh, information and got the tapes from someone from that uh, IP debate you had done with Wendy McElroy back in like '83, I think, right? Yes, and that was my first entry into this uh, uh, controversy. <clears throat> Yeah, and I think Wendy's was 81 and with some newsletters in California and then 83. Um, so I really think the modern debate on this started around then, to be honest. Um, well, actually, for me, uh, it, it went back even uh, further in time uh, because uh, I was part of the close circle of Samuel Edward Conkin III and mm-hmm. his magazines, uh, uh, New Libertarian Notes, New Libertarian Weekly, New Libertarian – and various other publications. And, uh, of course, I was also uh, good friends with Robert Lefebvre. Mm -hmm. And um, both Sam and Bob Lefebvre were opposed to the idea of state copyright and state patents. And uh, where I was coming in uh, was uh, uh, a very early attempt to justify not uh, status concepts, uh, being an anarchist, an agorist, uh, I'm opposed to that, uh, but to see if there was a natural law and natural Mm -hmm. rights basis uh, for concept of ownership of uh, of content, uh, which existed only as what today I now call media-carried property, but back then I call logo rights. Well, Uh, the idea being... Uh, the the idea being uh, that uh, something didn't have to be made out of uh, atoms and molecules right. in order to uh, in order to satisfy the requirements for a copyright claim. Yeah. Now Sam uh, allowed copyrights for individual writers in his publications, uh, so he was not so opposed to it uh, that he said no. It has to, it has to be without copyright. And at that time, I don't even think there were, were uh, Creative Commons licenses mm-hmm. uh, to attend to the discussion. Well, um... uh, and Bob Lefebvre, and Bob Lefebvre, while he was opposed to copyright, he actually endorsed my uh, my concept of logo rights as worth considering, uh, beginning right after my debate with uh, with Wendy McElroy. Uh, my, I would say that if I were to boil it down to my position today, is that uh, I am not so much discussing the question of intellectual uh, property or ideas as property, uh, uh, two concepts which I reject out of hand, but that I am uh, exploring uh, that property itself is 
an intellectual artifact. And as I posted uh, on your Facebook wall today, I think that it, it comes closest to being an intellectual artifact mm -hmm. of, um, uh, of contract law, whether or not, uh, uh, as, as you posted, uh, contract law is a uh, a subset of property law or whether property law is a subset of contract law is a debate I don't think it's, it, it, it's really worth you know, spending a lot of time on. But I do think that property itself is an intellectual concept mm -hmm. which falls under both uh, legal uh, discussion of legal rights and discussion of uh, natural law and natural rights as libertarians would understand it. Yeah. Well, before we get into your, your theories, let's talk a little, a little bit more about the background because I think we have another thing in common – um, maybe you would agree or not on this, but my suspicion is you had a, and I know you had sort of a Randian approach to some issues in, in your in your libertarianism, and you also were an R writer and a successful uh, uh, career writer, right, a novelist. So you had an interest in trying to find a way to justify uh, something that you had a. a uh, like a financial interest in, right? And I did too in a way because I was a patent attorney, and I still am, and that's one reason I started searching as well. And the reason I was searching was because I found Ayn Rand's – You know, she influenced me early on, and one of the worst – one of the arguments she made that, I, that never did persuade me was her argument for IP. Uh, it's something about it was just not like her other arguments. It was sort of arbitrary and utilitarian. It just didn't make sense like her other arguments did. But I was going to do patent law and copyright law for my career. So I started thinking – and I'm a libertarian. So I started thinking, let me find a better solution for this. So I was searching as well. It's just you came up with logo well, rights, and I came up with skepticism. It's, 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 it's ironic <laughs> uh, that you as a uh, patent lawyer – are probably uh, one of the leading scholars today, in opposed to the very field you are operating in, which is patent law. But in my case, um, I think you have it uh, uh, the, the cause and effect reversed. Uh, it was not that uh, my, my being a writer was not the reason why I felt it worth uh, pursuing. Okay. okay. But it was. Uh, it was my interest primarily as a libertarian natural uh, law okay. and natural rights okay. believer, All right. which, which, which led me to this. And in fact, I would say that I was probably more uh, influenced by Robert Lefebvre's uh, uh, per, uh, approach to property rights per se than I was to Ayn Rand's. Uh, okay, I accept that, but it, you would admit that there, there, there's, there's some – there tends to be some correlation um, – it, I tend to find that – Well, let, let me let you off the hook by saying that in my original article, mm -hmm. Informational Property Logo Rights, I did quote from Ayn Rand because I found that parts of her argument uh, were, uh, were expressive. But in terms of the basic theory of property, which I was pursuing, I thought that Robert Lefebvre made a, uh, a more comprehensive case. No, but what I was going to say is it, it seems to me to be no coincidence that – there's a disproportionate number of libertarian novelists who happen to support copyright, just like almost all patent lawyers happen to support patent and copyright. Do you follow me? I don't. I don't think it's quite a yes, coincidence. But you see, you know, it, it seems to me that that's uh, that's starting off uh, with, uh, with with uh, if I may use a term that uh, that Ludwig von Mises liked a lot, <clears throat> paralogia. In other words, it, uh, it, it transfers the argument from a debate of the merits right. to a debate on the motivations of the people right, who are right. arguing. Right, and I don't mean to argue substance by psychologizing, but I do find psychologizing fun sometimes. I can't, I can't uh, deny it. Um, and I do think that at least – at very least we should be aware of our, of, our, of our biases and try to be sure that if you're advocating something that happens to be in your favor that you have good reasons for it anyway. But of course the arguments stand on their own merits, I think. But the, okay. the, on the, by the converse, I get attacked quite often for being an IP lawyer and for opposing it as if – as if – as if if I, as if my arguments, if they were correct, is if you wouldn't expect an IP lawyer to be, be one of the people that would recognize that. I mean it's possible to actually know something about the field that is – Unjustified and corrupt, and to come to those conclusions, even though it's not in your, your you know, your personal immediate interest. 
Well, look, uh, just switching to somewhere else, just as a for instance, um, because what I'm, no what I'm noting is not uh, what I call hypocrisy, but merely irony, okay? Uh, wouldn't you find it ironic if uh, you had a medical doctor who claimed uh, uh, to be abortion and performed abortions? Well, say again, you were, you were, you were siloing on me. Okay, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying just to switch to another field. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that you being a patent lawyer opposed to patents is hypocritical. I'm saying it's ironic. Wouldn't you find it at least ironic if you had a, a medical doctor, an obstetrician, who said that he was opposed to abortion, who then, as part of his practice, performed abortions? Yes. In fact, I think that might be hypocritical. It could be, but – um, uh, first of all, I don't think there's anything wrong with pointing out irony any more than psychologizing. It's kind of interesting, and it may be ironic. I don't think it happens to be ironic. L let's suppose that there's a healthy um, uh, difference of agreement among the population as a whole or among academics or scholars about IP, 3070, whatever. I don't know. I mean it, it would be ironic if some percentage of patent lawyers didn't take that side, uh, that if everyone automatically agreed with it. As for the hypocrisy or the irony issue, it would be more ironic if I were out there um, uh, suing people in the name of IP. So I agree that would be more difficult. But if you understand the well, way that – Then let me, then let me establish this. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have never filed a lawsuit uh, on behalf of any of my literary rights. Right. No. I understand that, and I, because most I, most copyright holders don't have those scruples. You have your anarchist and your voluntarist scruples, so that that tamps down the excesses that might otherwise go to. So I understand okay, now that. Let me also make clear. Let me also make clear that in practice, um, uh, when uh, I have opposed uh, pirating of my rights, uh, I have only done so vocally in instances where I felt. That it was damaging to a third party, right? Like more, uh, more of a fraud as, type, a fraud type argument, or something like that. Well, not even, not even fraud, but let me give you an example. Uh, uh, there was supposedly, <laughs> and I'm not sure, uh, and, and I'm being told now that this never happened, but there was a representation that there was going to be a pirate screening uh, of the Alongside Night movie at Porkfest to compete with the official screening that I went to a lot of trouble to sell oh. at, at a right I heard about at, that at a movie theater right I heard about yeah, that yeah ne nearby mm -hmm. uh, Rogers campground mm -hmm. okay uh, and I was upset about it because the whole purpose of the screening was set up as a fundraiser for the free state project right and so I I felt that uh, a pirate screening competing with a fundraiser for the free state project was damaging to the free state project and that upset me I understand that. Of course, that has nothing to do with the validity of copyright or even logo rights, but I, right. I understand. And, that. and again, all of this is, you know, is sort of like, uh, as I say, paralogia. It's sort of like uh, it's inter it's an interesting background yeah. discussion, but but really, it doesn't it doesn't speak to the actual question of whether uh, uh, under a general theory of property rights, which I maintain uh, is a uh, a moral and a legal construct. It's a subset of a theory of natural rights uh, and nat of natural law leading to natural human rights uh, that I consider property rights to be a uh, primarily an ontological and moral issue. And then you get to it as a, uh, a as a legal issue. But let me start by conceding to you that as I observe it right now, the mainstream position of the libertarian movement, as I perceive it, is anti what they perceive as artist, uh, our artistic rights uh, in things uh, which are not physical objects. Okay. Uh, so in essence, I'm fighting an uphill battle, uh, a battle which you have the high ground. In the strategic high ground. Well, I understand that, but but and I think there's also, especially among anarchists, right? We are generally skeptical of existing statutory schemes, and so you know, someone like you who who supports some kind of, I don't want to call it intellectual property. You call it informational property, or now material carried property, and we can get into the details in a second. But me, you, me, media, media carried property. Media, sorry, media carried property. You. You shouldn't be in the position of having to defend the existing patent and copyright system. 
Um, no, and and I find it frustrating that uh, that, uh, that most of the vitriolic attacks on me <laughs> assume uh, that I am, you know, supporting uh, what is being uh, uh, portrayed as a monopolistic grant of privilege from the state. In my very first debate with Wendy, I started off by saying if uh, the concept I was putting forward uh, could not be defended other than as a, a, a monopolistic grant of privilege from the state, then I would then I would immediately abandon it. Well, but the problem is I would I would say and I'd see if you see if you agree with this, the vast majority of pro IP libertarians um, would oppose the abolition of patent and copyright, at least until we could replace it with their ideal system. So they do not have well, this abolitionist this view is, towards. And, and this this is where uh, I basically, you know, go into my, you know, u usual uh, uh, usual spiel about how I don't think that uh, any kind of property, if, if if there is in fact a property. That uh, uh, there should be sort of like uh, this, this is a status phrase, but it, it, it's a legal term of art. Most favored nation status. Um, uh, if you're going to say uh, that a copyright is statist, then why isn't a uh, a deed uh, from the county clerk just as status? And if you're going to say that uh, we need to ab uh, abolish now one, why not the other? But you see, see, then I see that as is you're trying to have it both ways because you. Act on the one hand like you're not in favor of defending the existing patent and copyright system, but when someone calls for abolishing it, then you equip, you, you sort of say, well, if we abolish that, why not abolish real real property titles? Uh, um, but you see, that's the thing. In other words, uh, presumably you drive a car which is uh, uh, which, which is registered with the Department of Motor Vehicles, and which you're not allowed to um, uh, uh, to operate uh, without without that license from the state. And presumably, uh, the land deed issued by, uh, by, by your county is in the same situation, uh, if, if you are in fact a homeowner, or if not, you know, want, want to remove as a renter of somebody who, who does have property, which has a deed issued by the county. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I, I just don't see the difference. Okay, well, so the problem I have with that argument, that analogy is um, you and I, as libertarians, don't have much disagreement on – the basic notion that there ought to be property titles re recognized in scarce resources like land. Um, we oppose the state well, monopoly. Scarcity, scarcity is only one is, is is only one of the things. Okay, and mm -hmm. I don't see scarcity as uh, as as absolute as I discuss in my article, uh, human property. Scar scarcity scarcity is not ab absolute. Okay. Be, uh, yeah. Well, let's I'm, just pick I'm, something I'll, on card. I'll, I'll refer people to that article rather than repeat. My yeah, I'll, I'll, and I'm going to link to it in the podcast. The human, the human. Uh, I have the, all the links. I'm going to link to this. Um, I'm just trying to pick something uncontroversial that we, we both agree there should be property rights in land. Right. Yes. We, and, and, I'm not a George, I'm not a Henry Georgist. And the basic function of the existing property title records offices in the counties around the country is to is to just keep track of that. Now, we oppose to the state monopolizing the function, but it's basically a correct function, a libertarian function. You can't just leap from that and say that uh, similarly the copyright system does something crudely, but it does a similar function because – well, for several reasons. We, we don't agree that, that these kinds of things should be property. That That's what we dispute, and – you know, the, the property title system itself is not terrible the way the state runs it. It's just that the state has the right to come in and seize your property because of eminent okay, domain. Well, you see, here we can get into another agreement immediately. Yeah. I think that the way uh, uh, that the laws <laughs> have been lobbied uh, uh, by, uh, you know, by large corporations to, uh, uh, to extend and protect their um, uh, claims of, of, of copyright – uh, and patent are egregiously anti-property rights. For example, uh, I'll, I'll give you one uh, one example in patents and uh, and another in copyright. Um, what Monsanto did in suing farmers whose crops were invaded by Monsanto seeds from you know from adjoining property mm -hmm. patented patented and then seeds right sued the small farmers who had no legal uh, you know ability to legal defend themselves against this me mega giant corporation uh, i think is one of the most horrific misuses of patent law that i can imagine similarly the way uh, the corporations such as disney have taken things that are traditional uh, traditional fairy fairy tales 
and uh, copyrighted them and then aggressively uh, attacked people who wanted to use this stuff which originated mm -hmm. you know long before Disney got to mm -hmm. it uh, and, and and sued the heck out of them to uh, to, uh, to restrict their doing so is equally egregious uh, Getty images in taking paintings uh, which hang in the Louvre mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, pursue claims against people who reproduce them well uh, you know things that go back hundreds of years is, is similarly egregious. So if, if you are looking for Daniel Shulman to agree with Stephen Kinsella, <laughs> Uh, that the way that the state handles this is egregious. We have no disagreement. Well, let me disagree a little bit on that. I, I wouldn't – I mean this is a, a quibble, but I wouldn't call it a misuse at all. Um, and I wouldn't blame Monsanto and uh, Getty. Uh, I mean maybe they're immoral, but they're using the legal rights the system gives them. In every one of – all three of the cases you mentioned, you can explain – why what they're doing is basically supported by the copyright and patent systems. This is, what they're doing is totally legitimate. Uh, and I'm not gonna, and I'm not going to disagree with you, that the, uh, the, but that that is the that is the problem with all statist law. None of it none of it uh, supports a a pure libertarian concept of uh, of property. Right. And in fact, one of the one of the historical reasons why libertarians have opposed such law is that they started out with grants. Uh, from you know yep. from kings and uh, other uh, yeah. and other royalties. Yep. Um, uh, so there is a, a, an historical uh, parallel, you know, uh, that the development of uh, this body of law was uh, corrupt going back uh, uh, to its root. It, it, to it's... me, but but to me, that that uh, is an artifact of statism itself. In other words, I would say uh, that, in fact, you know, the Robin Hood story of how you have, you know, the king's land being uh, being uh, uh, poached on, mm -hmm. okay, is just a uh, as as much of an argument not to have privately held land as the argument for uh, grants of privilege uh, from from kings being one of the earliest uh, uses of uh, of uh, of artistic creation. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's equivalent. In other words, the problem here is not uh, that we don't have something w which deserves to be treated as a property mm -hmm. right. The problem is we have the state. Yeah, I. So I, I. I don't quite agree. I don't think that that the argument that IP is unjust is the same as arguing that current property rights in land are unjust because of some corruption back in the old days, because we all agree there ought to be property rights in land, and we have to have some system for determining who the best owner is. So that's not really controversial. Hold on. You can't, you can't say that we all agree. All, but, all us uh, libertarians, there fact, yeah. You know, uh, there, there are, in fact, com communists who don't agree. Well, you and I agree, okay? You and I agree on the land issue, so um, uh, that that's one, one difference. The, the other thing is, you know, if someone asked a libertarian... Well, what would what would roads be like, and what would land title registry be like in a free market? We would say, well, it would be similar to what we have now. You'd have roads. It's just they'd have private owners, and that would have different economic effects and how they're run and all that. Yeah, we would have and, land and, and title and records. Fact, if, you, if you go to Cato and Reason, you're going to find uh, you're going to find scholars who found out that some of the earliest uh, highways and turnbacks were yes. in fact privately created. Then you then you get to the long history of the railroads, where you have all sorts of uh, uh, <clears throat> status and. In, in, but my point is you could use some of the existing common law based and other systems that we have as a rough model to what the libertarian system would look like, but it would be better. Uh, but you cannot say that. So in terms of IP, and I know you uh, – I could li give you 50 or 100 or 1,000 examples, and you might call them misuses of the system. I would just say this is just the implications of the current substantive law of patent and copyright that the state has created, and you would probably will, agree with I me on every one of those. I will immediately concede your historical point. What, uh, what, I, uh, what I represented in, uh, in 1983, mm -hmm. beginning with my debate with <clears> Wendy, <throat> is that I was putting forward a new natural rights theory right. that did not have an historical base. Right, I understand. So let's get let's get to something a little bit. Um, you and I have gone back and forth over the years, mostly in, in writing, and one reason I was just pinged you today was I was talking with another gentleman, and he, had, uh, he was questioning the IP issue, and we were talking about it, and I was trying to explain something to him, and I made the point, which is my view, which I don't know if you completely agree with, but I was arguing that, look, one of the fundamental mistakes in the IP argument 
uh, or in your logo rights argument, I believe, is th is this idea that you can own a, an attribute or an, or a characteristic or a feature of an object separate from the object itself? Okay, and then I said and that, and, Hold on. and that and that comes directly out of Robert Lefebvre's theory of properties. Okay, it may be, and it's it's also somewhat of an implication of of Locke. I think Locke was confused on his labor comments, et cetera. But and then I said, actually, J. Neil Shulman has modified his logo rights characterization, and you call it material material carried property, right? No, me media carried. Me property. Sorry, I keep messing it. Media carried property, and I said, so basically, you view it the same as I. You just have a different conclusion, and that's why I said, well, let's just talk about it because, and let me just summarize quickly what I think. The mistake is, and you can tell me where you think I'm wrong or where, where, what I'm missing. To my mind, if you own an object, and that's the media, because that's the physical thing that is owned, that that is always in patterned with some information or some attributes. And in fact, information cannot be a free floating abstraction. Information to exist and to be perceived and to persist has to be embodied in some media. Wouldn't you agree with that part? Uh, yes, but let me tell let me uh, let me tell you where I think you're going, where I think uh, that you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Go ahead. In my view, <clears throat> something intangible uh, can't, uh, uh, can't be owned. Okay. Uh, for something to be ownable, it has to be something observable in the world, and it has to be distinct and definite. Now the. Uh, the the question which uh, I arose, which you said that you uh, you agreed with my formulation. No, I don't agree that that's. I don't agree that's. Original, I don't agree that's sufficient. That all, that might be necessary. Let, 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 but let me, let me let me get this out as concisely as I can. All right, go ahead. Um, if you have an alphanumeric sequence, which retains its material identity in going from physical object to physical object, and is a commodity separate from the things on which it is carried, which gives value, trade value, to the objects on which it is carried, that, uh, but it is transferable from one physical entity to another. I maintain we have now identified an object, a thing, something observable and distinct in the real world, which is, in fact, a property separable from the objects on which it is carried. I got it, but and what's... the example that I gave in my debate with Wendy and have used ever since is you buy a book with the title Atlas Shrugged, you take it home and start reading, and what you read is it was the best of times, it was yeah. the worst of times. Right. Obviously, A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. It's not the same, it's not the same novel, but... What, if you are if you are reductionist to saying that what can be owned is only a physical object, then you have something which uh, will, uh, for the sake of argument, has the same number of pages, has uh, uh, ink impressions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. has the same binding. Mm -hmm. And so, if you are going to reduce it and say that only a physical object can be owned, mm -hmm. then the question arises: Did you get what you pay for? Or if you say yes, okay then you have now eliminated uh, uh, the possibility of uh, a novel being an existent, a thing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 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 an entity. Mm -hmm. Okay, to use it, not, not an existent so much as an entity. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're saying it cannot be a thing. But if you're saying that you're entitled to, uh, to the composition of words of Atlas Shrugged and not of A Tale of Two Cities, and you're saying that the composition of words, the uh, alphanumeric sequence itself, which is separable from the thing on which it is carried, the media carried property is the uh, is the economic good which is being yep. traded, yep. and therefore you have an economic good which is a thing separable from yep. the media on which yep. it is carried. Now, that I get is my you, I, argument. Yeah, I get your chain of reasoning. I think – let me see if I can s summarize it and tell me if I got it right. You start off with the presumption that if, if you can identify something as an existent entity, as a thing as you call it, Something that is what, what was your word, specific and definite. Th you're you're pres presupposing that that is n sufficient for ownership. Like as long as something is specific and definite, and you can give it some kind of ontological category or name and call it a thing, and especially if it's valued in commerce and therefore it's a quote commodity, 
which I guess is only economic goods, not other kind of goods, then that's sufficient for ownership. I just don't see the argument no, for the starting I point of the argument. I would say I would say necessary but not sufficient. Okay, but, but... Uh, there are other there are other there are other things. It has to be, uh, and, and I and I and in my original uh, uh, debate <clears throat> with Wendy, and then in my subsequent 1983 uh, uh, treatise, informational property logo rights, I go through a whole bunch of other things that are necessary, but they're the same uh, sets of questions that have to be satisfied okay. for any other claim of ownership. Well, the way you just stated it, though, you only specified what was sufficient for ownership but i'm sorry what was necessary for ownership not what was sufficient because just because no i'm i i i'm i'm saying that i'm saying that i have ident identified a category of things that that can can be owned if the the same questions can be answered in the affirmative that you would uh, that you would have to answer for any claim of ownership of anything else see i just don't think that that to me that doesn't make sense and for several reasons number one I, and I tried to give you an example in writing today. Um, just as a pure contract situation, you you could have a contract and the concept of fraud. Even if you want, you don't need to bring fraud into this. It's just contract. Contract theory and property rights alone explain why you're not getting what you asked for when you get the book that has the wrong pattern of information on it. In other words, if if I give you money conditioned upon the book having a certain pattern in the book, and I don't get that, then the money that I paid you didn't transfer to you because it was conditioned upon a certain oh, but you see it didn't it, it it doesn't have to be fraud i have in i have in my look i'm a publisher i'm a book publisher okay and i have uh in my possession uh an art uh, an accidental artifact of a book which i received from a uh, lightning source the cover is the cover of my novel the rainbow cadenza yeah but the interior of the book uh, is uh, uh, is volume one of Robert LeFay's autobiography. Now, there was no deliberate fraud when no, uh, no, this was yeah. manufactured. Let's forget fraud, right? Let's just assume so in other words, I'm, I'm not making I'm not making a legal argument so much as I'm making an ontological argument. I'm saying uh, that yeah uh, that if if in fact the comp uh, the composition the alph alphanumeric sequence in this particular case. Uh, is different, then you have a different thing, a different commodity. Right, but the different commodity is the is the physical book, which is different than another physical book because of the way it's impatterned. The question is, can you own the attributes of the book in addition to the book itself? That's the question. Can you own? Well, I mean, in, in fact, in, in in fact, and uh, uh, you know, this this is the case, even uh, even when there was no cop, uh, copyright law to be enforced. Uh, in fact. Um, you can you can argue. Look, uh, I, I, I will I will tell you right now that the argument you're making is one which is generally accepted uh, by the film and television industry. Uh, the Writers Guild treats writing as if it's an act of labor, uh, but they are much less specific on whether the labor produces something which can be owned. And I'll I'll, I'll tell you that you know. Uh, that this is uh, something which the the, the, the Writers Guild um, calls separation of rights. In other words, uh, if you if uh, if I as a screenwriter were to write uh, for let's say Gunsmoke, uh, uh, it's a work for hire because I'm basically uh, creating new stories right, based right. on their existing characters. But when I write an original episode of the Twilight Zone, an anthology series, they say I have separated rights uh, unless it's a remake of an earlier Twilight Zone, you know, such as the 1980s Twilight Zone that I worked on, remade some episodes from the original Rod Serling uh, Twilight Zone from the 50s and 60s. So if, uh, if I were the writer who is uh, creating a new script based on an original uh, you know, script by uh, uh, Richard Matheson or... or uh, you know, or Charles Beaumont or Rod Serling, uh, then there is no separated rights because it's a work for hire. But uh, it, you know, if I if I create an original script with you know uh, with original story not based on that, right. then there's a, a separation of rights. Yeah, so, but these are all just legal uh, terms based on current copyright. I don't really see how that's yeah, these relevant. These are legal, yeah. legal terms of art. It's okay? not really it's not really relevant um, to what we're discussing. Philosophy of what natural property rights would be. I mean, you wouldn't have right. all these arcane uh, arrangements. I am, I am, I am arguing, first of all, uh, 
that all property exists only as an intellectual artifact. Uh, in my, and, and where I make this argument uh, the most concisely is in my essay, Human Property. But didn't you, didn't you just say earlier that you don't believe in property and intangible nothing things? Found in nature, it, nothing found in nature is property, that it is basically human, uh, a human intellect uh, which creates the concept of property itself. Well, that's true. But you could say human desire creates it too, but that doesn't mean desire gives rise to property rights absent other features. You know, um, uh, um, No, but what we're, what we're talking about is how human, human beings interact with each other, and, they, and unlike, uh, unlike you know, uh, non-intellectual uh, animals, we do it on the basis of intellectual constructs. Okay, let me try to summarize a, a different way to look at it and get your take on this. It seems to me like your argument is basically this. You want to say, look, here's a book. There are two books that look identical on the outside. They have different patterns on the inside. You would be upset if you wanted one and you got the other. Therefore, it's a commodity or some kind of economic good. And because it's an economic good, that shows that the pattern, the logos as you call it, is an ontological thing that has existence. And then That's you leap, argument. which I don't disagree with that as a philosophical exercise. It's just you want to leap from that to saying, aha, because I've identified that there's a thing that has ontological existence, therefore it can have an owner. That to me is the entire mistake you're making because you haven't well, showed that I, that's necessary. I, I approach this a number of different ways in my original uh, Informational Property Rights 1983 article, and one of the ways I approach it is a reductio ad absurdum using um, uh, praxeology. In, 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 my, in my reply to Konkin, his, uh, his article, Copy Wrongs, Mm -hmm. uh, I, bas uh, I basically uh, uh, deconstruct several of his several of his premises, in which I show using uh, Austrian economics uh, a, a praxeological approach, how in fact, uh, if you de uh, if, if you eliminate uh, if you eliminate that concept, then uh, you basically uh, run into the contradiction of saying that that which you are arguing about doesn't exist, uh, you know. There, there. You know, I think that it is not a coincidence that literary contracts, regardless of whether uh, we're talking about copyright or not, refer Which to something are. as the work. In other words, it's a noun. It is not because that's how the copyright arguing. statute, the copyright statute it's, defined it's it that way. It's not arguing labor. It's arguing that there is a thing that is being traded called the work. It is referred to uh, in, in the con in the contracts. Granting rights, which uh, which I have signed, uh, there is a uh, a term of art called the work. That's just how it's defined in the and copyright I'm statute. That, that is a thing which is in fact being traded or licensed uh, in the same way that there is uh, a right of occupancy which is being traded in a rental agreement. Right. Uh, you know, uh, you know, for 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 a car or an apartment. Well. Okay, so the copyright statute defined that term "work," and that's why contracts use it now. It's just an uh, the, the copyright statute is is beside the point as far as I'm concerned. I don't think they would I'm use the term "work" working. if not for the copyright statute. We're talking, this is talking. Pl we're talking plain language. But they wouldn't use that word if the copyright statute hadn't introduced and defined it. That's that's a new innovation. Uh, in the I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that that's true. I, in other words, what you're what you're what are, you're arguing. Uh, is which is the cart and which is the horse, and so am I. And I'm maintaining uh, that there is a, a copy. Uh, there, there is a common sense observation uh, in these contracts, which would survive the demise of the state and its uh, uh, and its. Yeah, I know. Uh, admittedly, mucked up copyright law. Well, let me ask you this: Do, Would you agree with me that your argument to work, you need to show that something having ontological existence is sufficient for for there to be property rights possible in it don't you think you need to establish that uh, i think i think that given that you need to establish uh the the same bound boundary issues uh that you would uh with other uh other other uh forms of property and contracts that uh yes uh, it it qualifies as being entered into the running as a possible type of property. My point is, you have to show it, though. You have that is a presupposition of your argument that being establishing that something is of ontological existence is an existent is sufficient for it to be ownable. 
You have to prove that. It's, ne- it's, nece- it's necessary to qualify it for the debate on whether or not it is a property. I mean, my, my view on this, I'm, I'm very randy in, in my epistemology, my concept theory. I just think what you're doing is you're, you're doing reification in a sense. You're, you're conflating the efficiency and the usefulness and the practicality of certain concepts with – Calling something existing and then leaping to the point where it can be owned. Like, so, so for example, I think the concept of love is a valid concept. It has a referent in the world. You could say there is love. But just because we've identified an ontological type of thing that exists, love, doesn't mean it's a type of thing that can be owned. You, you, you have to do more than establish the validity of a concept, concept to show that the referent of the concept is an ownable thing. I mean, we have time, well, yes, we have motion. I, 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 I agree with that, but that, in fact, it, when, when you're identifying <laughs> something which exists... Uh, look, love is something which is an, expre- uh, which is an expression, okay? And uh, it is something which may be ob- uh, observable uh, in, uh, in human behavior, but, but it is not something which you can identify as existing outside okay. uh, of human behavior in the way that an alphanumeric sequence is. Well, I maintain that an alphanumeric sequence is, in fact, a thing. That hold on a, a second, hold uh, on a second, that, hold on, hold on. Earlier you, well, you said... An, 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 an array of frames, of, of photographic frames, is, a, uh, is an observable thing in the real world. Not, I'm not, out, not outside of human behavior. You, you said earlier that property doesn't exists, even exist, right? It's in the real world. Hold on. You said, even in the, you said property doesn't even exist outside of human uh, intentions and human subjective valuation. So how could alphanumeric sequences in something called a movie exist without regard for, for human intention? Okay, because thingness is one of the necessary but not sufficient conditions for a claim of ownership. Ownership is about action and, uh, and, uh, intele- and intellectual creation of identity. And uh, look, I would say that the identity uh, exists independent. The thing that exists, this is why it's uh, both uh, an ontological and an epistemological question before you get to the, uh, the moral and legal questions. What I think that my work has done is established the, uh, the ontological and epistemological basis for these uh, media-carried objects okay. to be identified as ownable in the same nope. way that other uh, things can be ownable according to the general common sense principles of common I got it. No, I understand your general thrust, but um, you seem to be agreeing because you say it on occasion. You seem to be agreeing with me that thingness, which is just another way of saying something exists, or in my view, it just means it's a valid concept. Thingness is a necessary but not sufficient condition. That's why I keep saying that I just want to make sure you agree with yeah, me. That that's you, what I'm saying. But you need ne- to ne- – Necessary but not sufficient, but the sufficiency – is by applying the exact same question that you yeah, would yeah. for any other claim of property. Yes, I understand. So, so and let, let's, we don't have time to get into that. But in your argument, in your logo rights article, and I think in your what's what's the other one? Human rights, or what's it called? Human property. Human property. Yeah, in that one, I think you you try to give reasons why you think it is sufficient. I don't agree with you on that, but I think that's really the crux of our disagreement. But before we before we would go, you, let, would you go at least can we at least come to the point? Where you think it is debatable within the realm of possibility? Honestly, I don't, Neil. But it's only because I've thought about it so much, and I can see no way that you can own the characteristic of an object um, without that being a universal that gives you property rights in other people's owned resources. In other words, to my mind, information. Oh, okay. and, and, and here, and here, and here's where I'm saying that the, defi- the defining distinction, which makes it possible, is that it is something. Outside of one human being, it's something that now exists in the world. Let, At the point where it exists, it exists in the world, separate from the person who brought it into existence, now you have something real. Let me ask you this. Is your view here – is it platonic or mystical at all? Because I know you're a little bit mystical more than I am on some 
spiritual issues. So does this view, because it seems to uh, me... I, back, back in 1983, when I was making these arguments, I was an atheist. I'm asking about now, though. I understand. But do you think there's anything mystical or platonic about what you're saying? Because you seem to envision these... Well, only, only, in this, only in the sense uh, that Ayn Rand uh, used the term spiritual... No, I don't mean uh, that. I, I mean, I mean, it's like you're envisioning the separate sort of ghostly existence of these of these platonic objects that are out there, independent ontologically, separate from well, the. I don't, I don't. I don't. I don't accept the uh, 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 platonic uh, metaphysics. Well, but, but, uh, you know. Well, would you agree that inf look, information has to be? Me, hold on. Let me ask look, you this. Uh, let, let me let me say this. Okay. Uh, I have made the argument that there's no such thing as a virtual reality. That, uh, uh, that it's obvious something is real or it isn't. Uh, you go back to the movie The Matrix, okay? And in fact, there were these bodies, you know. Yeah, 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 of course. There's up. always an underlying me underlying media or and an underlying that was world. reality. Yeah, there's a substrate. I understand. I agree with you on that. But my point is wouldn't you agree that information, for information, these alphanumeric sequences you're talking about, they're always embedded in some substrate or some media? They have to be. Just the impatterning of a thing. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yes, and uh, yes, and that's why I, I, I talk about media carry property, and the this, and the question is whether or not there is something okay. separable which can be transferred Fine. Uh, from physical object to physical object Fine. to physical object. L and, and that is uh, and that is the distinction which makes it a thing in and of itself. Well, let's forget about whether it's separable. Let's just let me ask you this: If all information has to be embodied or impatterned in a media, don't you agree the media has an owner? That physical thing that is the media has some owner. Yes, and and that, and the ownership of that can be separated from the ownership of the thing which is carried. It can be. Um, I, I suppose it could be, but. How does the fact that someone writes a novel give them the ability to control the media that other people own? Because, uh, because there is a thing being carried for which property rights have not been transferred. Hold on. Uh, hold on. A, Wait, uh, Neil. Hold on. Hold on, Neil. Give me thirty. Give me thirty seconds. Hold on, Neil. Neil. Hold on. I got to answer the door. Hold on, thirty seconds. Neil, thirty if, seconds. If you book a ride with Uber, you, uh, uh, your uh, claim to a ride is a usage which is separable from ownership of the vehicle. Hey, hold on. Neil. Neil, sorry, I yeah. had, to answer, had to answer the door. Sorry, go ahead. I'll, I'll, re I'll repeat that because I don't know if you heard it. I'm saying I'm saying that it is separable in the same way that if you book a ride with Uber. Uh, what you are buying is a use, but you're not buying uh, the Uber vehicle itself. Well, I agree some things are separable, especially mostly by contract or by co-ownership arrangements, but that doesn't mean that you can control what other people do with their property unless you have a good reason. I go with the Lockean and Rothbardian theory of property. Hold on, you're, begging, you're, 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 you're making an assumption. You're begging the question. You're saying you're restricting what other people can do with their property. Yes. I'm maintaining that while what is uh, what is being argued over is in fact what is not being transferred to somebody else and what they cannot do because it is not their property. Well, but there's not always a transfer. So, so for example, uh, uh, if uh, let's take the patent case, okay? If you get a if you claim a property right in being the owner of this mousetrap design, all right? Now, if I am toiling away in my garage and with my own wood and steel, my own substrate, and I configure it into a certain shape, uh, you can use the patent system to tell me I can't sell that. I can't even do make that device. Now, where was the transfer? Uh, you know, Stephen, I have to, I have to say uh, that over the years I have become a lot less sanguine over arguing about patent rather than copyright. Okay. Uh, I think I think that the case, the the case for patent is a harder case okay. than uh, okay. I've been arguing. Or what I've been calling media carry. Property. Well, let, let me do kind of a lightning round with you to hit because there's some things I want to get talk to you about because you know a lot of things about the history and Konkin and these things and um, not to dwell too much on them. Let me just get your your take on some things. Number one, do you okay. believe? Let's just stick with copyright because you think that is some rough rough system that approximates something like might could exist in a free society. Do you think that the time limits on copyrights should be finite? And arbitrary or perpetual? 
Uh, I think that uh, uh, for media carry property, uh, you ask the exact same questions that you would for ownership of any other kind of property. So the problem with the copyright system is that it expires in about 120 years. In your view, it should last forever. The, yeah, but, you, but but again, you're talk, you're talking about a state uh, a, a status defined system. I understand, but, um, but one def, one the defect of the also, system is the, that they could okay. also arbitrarily say that land ownership ends with death and can't be and, and can't be carried. I, I, uh, I know. I'm just I just want to get you on record and see what you think. I mean, you do realize the original Copyright Act was about I, 14 I, I, years. I, I, all I'm saying is is that when approaching uh, this question, I think you need to uh, to uh, satisfy the same requirements uh, that you would. Uh, for uh, ownership and transfer of any other kind of property. Are you aware, by the way, that uh, Jefferson, uh, when the Bill of Rights was being uh, considered, he wrote a letter to Madison, and he proposed uh, – because at that time, the uh, the uh, the copyright clause was already in the, in the Constitution, right, 1789. But for the Bill of Rights, Jefferson proposed um, amending the Bill of Rights or, or adding adding a provision to the Bill of Rights saying that um, the state can grant these monopolies – by which he meant copyright and patent, but only for X years. So he wanted to put a time limit in there, um, you know, probably yeah, 14 Jefferson, years. Jefferson, like Locke, uh, was uh, taking a utilitarian approach. Um, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I wrote an entire novel, The Rainbow Could End, attacking the concept of utilitarianism mm -hmm. uh, being uh, sufficient mm -hmm. uh, to, to come up with fairness in human mm -hmm. affairs. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm an absolute believer uh, in theories of natural law and natural rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I would say that that would separate me from uh, Jefferson and Locke. So you, so in your system, you couldn't even publish, you couldn't even republish the Bible or Shakespeare's plays or Homer's uh, Homer's works without getting some permission from some long, long lost and uh, descendant down the line. I mean, there would be a huge. You'd have to have permission for everything. There'd be a per complete permission culture for all ideas. Well, I mean, uh, again, I, I expand the question to every other sort of property. Yeah, so that's a yes. In other words, do we need to um, uh, do we need to get uh, permission uh, from the heirs of the uh, uh, of, of of the Roman emperors uh, before we can take a tour of mm -hmm. the Colosseum? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, so let me ask you this one uh, about Konkin. Um, um, you mentioned that he didn't oppose people using copyright, or, or in some cases, and in, in Lefebvre either. I mean, of course, I don't either. I've gotten copyright on my works and used it before. Um, it's Sam, just... Sam did, did not copyright his own works, and Robert Lefebvre did not copyright his own works. Well, you realize that copyright's automatic, so that that's actually not true. They do have copyright in their works. As soon as you write something, you have a copyright. Well, according, according to the state, but I mean, are, 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 we, are, are, we, are we going – these are two people who did not recognize the authority of the state to define these questions. Well, but they had copyright in their works. Whether they wanted it or not, according um, to the state, but not according to their uh, uh, their own preferences. Well, but yeah, but someone couldn't have co someone can't can, someone can't go publish one of Lefebvre's books right now without getting permission from someone, even though Lefebvre himself might have opposed copyright, unless he put some kind of license. Uh, on that them. would be that would be the case if it were an unpub uh, if if it were an unpublished work, uh, uh, then uh, that argument could be made. In, fa in fact, I'll tell you where this arises uh, in, in a practical sense. As far as I know, the only copy of the manuscript uh, for Samuel Edward Conklin III's Counter Economics is in the hands of Victor Coman. Right. And Victor Coman has published other of, of Sam's works, uh, which were first published when, uh, when Sam was alive. And Sam explicitly published them without a copyright. But in the case of counter economics, no, that's not true. Uh, the you, you, you can't publish something uh, the, without a copyright. The, uh, the, the legal rights to this are held by the Konkin estate, uh, which is, uh, which uh, devolves upon Sam's uh, brother, Alan Konkin, in which uh, Alan has made me the literary executor. So Victor is in the position of having the only manuscript, yeah, uh, of uh, you know the only physical manuscript which he refuses to provide to the estate, but. He cannot legally publish it himself Correct. without uh, permission from the estate. Right. Well, this is just the kind of bizarre logic that comes from any type of IP system, I believe. So that's is, you can you can blame the state's copyright system, but I think it's just the logic of copyright. You're going to get these these absurd and uh, um, obviously unjust and obscene results. It's just an inevitable part of separating the idea of ownership from scarce resources. Um, I wanted to ask you. You mentioned earlier that in your earlier arguments you tried to. You tried to rely on praxeology to support your case. 
I think praxeology. Uh, one, it, it's, it's one of the one of the, in my original like in three article informational property logo rights. Uh, I reply. Uh, Sam makes a, uh, makes what he uh, what he represents as a praxeological case, and so I responded with a praxeological case. Right, and, and what I was going to say is I think that praxeology and especially Mises's you know version of the Austrian economics is is absolutely crucial and indeed essential to getting these issues straight. But I think it points in the other direction. I think that praxeology basically regards human action as the employment, right, the unconscious purposeful employment of scarce means to achieve something in the world guided by knowledge. So praxeology views well, human let, action. Let's start, let's, start, let's start out with the first premise of Austrian economics, which I used as, uh, uh, as uh, you know, uh, which I almost parodied as the first line of my novel, Alongside Night. Mises argues human, human beings act to remove felt unease. Correct. Okay. That's their purpose. And That's I their motivation. The first right. line of the novel, Elliot Vreeland felt uneasy the moment he entered his classroom. Right, and I think that's a brilliant aspect of praxeology, but it only goes to the motives or the purpose. What human action is, is it's the employment of scarce means, which you can call scarce resources, guided by knowledge. So there's two important components to successful human action. One is the availability. Right. The, 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 Mises then goes on through uh, you know a whole a whole sen- uh, you know a whole series of de- deductive uh, I, de- derivations I from know. that premise. I, I'm just focusing on the bare structure of. Pre- I just want to get your take on this, okay? My argument is very okay. simple, and I think Mises is right. When we act in the world, we're trying to achieve an outcome, right? To remove felt uneasiness or to achieve something at the end of the process, but we do it by employing scarce means. That are causally effective in the world, and we do it by using our knowledge to decide what to do. So you have to have knowledge, and you have to have scarce means. Property rights apply sure. to this. But you see, I, again, and I, uh, I, I think that I made uh, <laughs> this argument in one of my other articles, uh, responding to that uh, uh, video. Uh, uh, copying, uh, copying is not theft. By Nina Palin. You know, I, yeah. res- I respond. I, I responded uh, to that in. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's linked in article called the Libertarian Case for IP. Um, but I'm just. I'm, I'm just I'm trying. I'm just, hold on. I'm just trying to. Uh, I'm, I'm basically uh, saying that scarcity is itself a uh, a limited. Concept, in other words, that it is a relative concept. But, but what do you? But there, hold on. Uh, that there is no requirement for absolute scarcity. It merely needs needs to be scarcity within a particular context. But what do you mean when you say you're opposed to intangible property and that you think all information is in a media? A media is a scarce physical resource. Land is a scarce well, physical I'm, resource. I'm, ar- I'm arguing that if there is an alphanumeric sequence, for example, uh, then that. Uh, alphanumeric sequence is a unique object. There's only one I, of it. I, I know you think and it's a unique object. If there's only one of something, it is by definition scarce. It's okay, but but let's go back. I I, I want to just finish this very short praxeological argument and see what you think is wrong with it because you keep stopping me before I get to the end. And it's very simple. We employ scarce okay, means. We employ scarce means. That is, you manipulate things in the world that can have a cause and effect. But to do that, you have to have some idea of what causality is, what ca- what the physics laws are, and you have to have some idea of what's possible and what you're going to achieve. So knowledge is in your head. It guides your choice of means and your choice of ends. So every action is the employment of scarce means and the use of knowledge. Would you agree with that? Uh, I, w- I would say… Uh, that that is a chain of reasoning which precedes the possibility of property. Yes. I, I'm ju- yeah, I'm just saying that it's inconceivable to imagine human action that doesn't employ scarce means and that doesn't isn't guided by knowledge. Correct. Well, uh, uh, yes, but uh, but there's the uh, but there's the possibility of uh, of human action acting on something which is which is ubiquitous. Uh, yeah, and, that's the, uh, yeah, right. So. That's the general condition and of human in, action, and, right? In, in doing so, converting something from ubiquitous, ubiquitous to scarce. Th- that's possible. I'm just saying that the structure of action is that every single human action has to employ scarce means and has to be guided by knowledge. It's just inconceivable without well, it. In, 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 in a sense… Well, wait. Do you agree with uh, that or think, not? Oh, hold on. Let, 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 me answer you, let me try to answer your question. I think that human action is itself 
a, a, a scarcity. And therefore, the employment of human action on something else uh, has at least the potential uh, to satisfy the conditions of creating a, uh, a, a scarce something. That's fine, but I'm, I'm not talking about the end result of your action. The end result of an action does not need to be the acquisition of a scarce resource or the ownership of some object. The end of an action could be anything. It could be totally subjective, right? It might, it might be to get a little girl to smile after you do no, a card trick. No, the, uh, hold on. The reason of the human mind uh, which affects uh, an action uh, – is not the same thing, and I would say that there is a disconnect once the results of that action uh, produce an etching in the real world, which is separate from the actor and observable by other actors. Yeah, I know, but you're, you're okay. But you're getting on. I'm, I'm not trying. To, I'm just talking about if you view human action praxeologically as the employment of scarce means to a, to achieve an end. And the and the and the cho- and the the action that you could take is guided by knowledge. That that shows that knowledge or information and the we're avail- we're, 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 we're having a uh, a communication artifact problem at the moment. Is that you, uh, what you just said verbal? Could you say it again, please? Oh, sorry. What I'm trying to say is my understanding of the way property norms arise and the way they relate to Mises' economic understanding. Oh, of human- I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Stephen. Uh, when you're talking, I'm not hearing just verbally. Mm-hmm. Uh, try saying it one more time. Test, test, test. Can you hear me now? Hello, test. Neil? Yeah, I'm, I'm not really getting anything. Do you want to uh, stop the recording and call me back and start it again? Sure, I'll do that right now. Hey, Neil, sorry about that. I'm uh, I'm call- let's just yeah, finish. I'm you. Yeah, let's just finish it up quickly. What I'm doing is I'm calling you on one iPhone. I'm just recording it over the <laughs> over the air on another a very low tech solution because uh, everything's always glitchy in technology. Um, in fact, why don't we why don't we wrap it up? Let's do this while we still have signal. Yeah, let's just wrap it up. I, I told you what I wanted. I was just running an alternative proxyological theory by you, and the basic argument is that you need property rights in the scarce means that are essential to human action. But you cannot have property rights in the knowledge that guides human action because that's not a scarce resource. But I take it you don't. I, I, you don't I, agree. Agree. I, agree, I agree with you. I'm not making a knowledge, or, uh, I'm not making a knowledge or, uh, argument. Well, you do believe in informational property, so you think there's property rights in information. I believe that information per se cannot be owned, but uh, an information object can be, and that is a crucial distinction. Okay. Okay. Well, I think. In the same way, yeah. In the same way that you can't own matter, but you can uh, own things made out of matter. You can't own information, but you can uh, own things made out of information. So, like, if you own a horseshoe, you don't own the matter in the horseshoe. You only own the way the matter is shaped. I'm sorry, say, say that again, please. So, like, if you own a horseshoe, you don't own the, the metal matter of the horseshoe. You only own the way the horseshoe is shaped. You know, you own the thing. You own the thing which is the horseshoe. Uh, in the same way that uh, if uh, you own a novel, you own the thing that is the novel. Let me ask you this: which is a, which so, is a part from the things on uh, on which it is. In the same way that that, you know, that if you, you can own, uh, I think that you could own the horseshoe without owning the horse. Yeah, but but so so let's suppose lightning strikes the horseshoe and melts it, and now you have. Um, a puddle of molten iron. Do you own that, or do you lost the ownership of it because it's not a horseshoe anymore? Uh, let me ask you this. <laughs> if you own a house and the house burns down, do you own the uh, the ashes? Yes, I would say that because I don't believe that the ownership of the house is dependent upon its shape. Well, here we have an interesting thing uh, because unless, you know, the, the soul... Uh, the, 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 the soul copy of a thing is destroyed, then you have something which is uh, durable, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, destroying a carrier of it does not necessarily destroy uh, 
the, the thing which is carried. But it does, because because you can't have information without some media that it's carried in. Information. Right. Inf- there could be, uh, yes. And, and, yeah, and there could be multiple copies of it. I know. And, 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 here, and here is a case where there needs to be <clears throat> at least one surviving carrier. Right, but you, but but this also this also implies there could be multiple copies of it. So you want to call it one object. There could be multiple, there could be multiple copies, but that uh, the way that I would phrase that is what is the variable is the number of uh, of carriers. There is still only one unique object which is being carried. Yeah, so it's a universal, or it's or it's or it's a platonic. It's, that's why I say it's a platonic object to me. It seems like, but well, no, I I I, I can understand. I can understand why from a philosophical philosophical standpoint, uh, this concept could be regarded by Plato as uh, as platonic. Uh, however, I am not a Platonist, and I'm not making a platonic argument. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, there there it is. Well, I'm I mean, a li- I believe that Aristotle had the concept of the atom, uh, but the uh, you know, but uh, but later science, you know, started talking about uh, electrons and neutrons and protons and, uh, and 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 sub and sub particles, you know, called you know uh, you know quarks, you know. So uh, you know, uh, just because the the language seems to uh, say something. Which was said by the ancients doesn't mean it's equivalent. Sure, um, sure. Uh, I uh, anyway, I'm going to tie it up now. I'm a little upset with you because I asked you to keep this to thirty minutes, and you insisted on going a whole hour, Neil. I'm, I'm sorry. How, how much did we actually do? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I don't know because I have it broken up. Probably about an hour and five minutes. Well, I don't have a problem with that. No, no, I'm joking. But then I'm again, uh, you you and I have no problem being loquacious. That's true. That's true. Um, well, I appreciate your time um, and uh, and your your uh, your sincerity on this issue. Um, I think for now we'll have to agree to disagree, but at least people can listen to this and see where you're coming from and uh, evaluate the different ways of looking at this stuff. I I, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, Neil. Hold on. Hold on after after I stop, and uh, we'll chat. Talk to you later. Thanks, man.